Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're gonna be talking about containerized web scraping with C Sharp and Selenium. Okay, so why are we making this video? Well, previously I made a video like this for F Sharp web scraping, and I thought this would be an interesting opportunity to kind of showcase um, the differences, but also mainly the similarities between these two .NET dialogue of uh, F Sharp and C Sharp. So in this video, um, basically the question I'm trying to answer is how can we do basic web scraping with C Sharp? Uh, in the process, we're gonna to touch on a few things. So obviously Obviously, web scraping essentials, uh, like making clicks, parsing web pages, stuff like that. Um, but also diving into containerizing the dependencies that you'll need because there are a lot of them. I'm gonna be using like real browsers and stuff like that. And then finally showing you how to actually do the application logic, how to actually drive this stuff with C Sharp. Um, and so basically the demo that I'm gonna be showing you today and that you can kind of get your hands on is a containerized C Sharp web scraper using Selenium for that web driving. Um, so the environment that we're gonna be utilizing is just Docker containers. I'm using Docker Compose for configuration. Uh, for web driver, using Selenium. Yes, there are other web drivers out there um, that are similarly featured and stuff, but Selenium is pretty mature, uh, pretty well liked in the community and works in a lot of different languages. So that's what I went with. with. Um, and then the language, of course, is going to be C Sharp because that's the focus of this video. Okay, so how are we going to go through all this stuff? There is a lot of stuff to go over. And the way that I broke it down is first, just give you an overview of how all this stuff works together, what it does. Uh, then we're going to dive into the containerization infrastructure so you can kind of understand like the foundation of how this stuff is working with its dependencies with their computer, because I think this is where most people will get stuck. And then finally, we'll go into the actual application logic of how do you actually do the web scraping with C Sharp. Okay, let's start with the overview. Uh, so at its very basic, like the most basic we can kind of describe this in is you write your C Sharp program, you're gonna run it on your laptop or computer or wherever it is, and it's just gonna go to the web and do some stuff, do some clicks, do some parsing, whatever it is you wanted it to do. Um, and the one that we're showing you today, the demo uh, project that I'm gonna show you is basically gonna go to the New York Times and it's gonna scrape that. So it's gonna go to New York Times.com. It's going to take a screenshot of the web page and then it's just going to parse um, and then print out all of the article titles that it finds. Now, how it actually does this stuff uh, gets quite a bit more complicated when we start looking at dependencies. Um, so, this is it from a high level, and then we'll go into the different parts you know, later on in this video. Um, but from a high level, you know, you've got your laptop or a computer, whatever you're, you're running this on. Um, and the first thing that's going to set up is Docker Compose, um, which is just our configuration infrastructure as code. And the main thing it's going to do is it's going to sh create a shared uh, file system between the computer and the container that we're spinning up. And this is gonna be really useful for us to actually share those screenshots in a place that we can access it as human. The next thing it's gonna do is it's gonna start those um, containers. So we're gonna get a container that's going to build our C Sharp project, um, install all its dependencies and stuff like that and ship it out as an executable. And then we're gonna have another container layer which is going to be installing the Selenium dependencies we need, including Chrome, the Chrome driver, setting up the, all the paths and variables and stuff like that. And then it's actually gonna run it. So this is what's gonna create our instance of Chrome, our web browser and this is what's going to actually go out to the web and do its stuff, whether it's like downloading the web page, making clicks, or um, saving the screenshot. All right, now I want to show you what this project looks like when we run it. So here I have VS Code open into my project. I'm right here, fetch New York Times console CS, and I'm just going to run this command. Um, basically, it's going to tell Docker Compose, hey, kill any versions um, that are currently running, remove any of the existing images, and do a full rebuild. We can see that this is going to start building our Docker containers. This looks like it's the .NET version. Uh, it's going to build everything install everything and then actually publish this as a standalone and I'll, I'll show you the actual uh, files in a bit um, and now it's actually running the web scraper we can see it's starting up Chrome driver and Chrome and then it just got to the New York Times and it's printing out some stuff and here's all the article titles so that's what it looks like and then uh, the screenshot I have outputting to this folder and we can see that this is what the web browser was able to see when it went to the website all right so that's what the project looks like and that's what it does um, there's the proof that it actually runs and now let's dive into the different parts of this now this is a lot of code that I'm going to show you. Uh, so if you want to look at the code and get it yourself, you can get the full source code here on the website. And it also has instructions for how to get the full project files if you just want to download it and then run it on your own machine. Okay, so now let's dive into the containerization infrastructure. So I really like building with containers, um, but I know a lot of people don't. They think it's like too much work and stuff. So I wanted to start off with why am I building this stuff in containers? So the main reason I like building in containers is that it provides deterministic environments for your code to run basically on any computer. So this means that I can run it on my desktop, I can run it on my laptop, I can theoretically spin up a server in the cloud and run it, and it should do basically the same things uh, as long as I've got like Docker and Docker Compose installed. And when we think about it and we think about like what is good code and what is good like systems, um, you know, I'm big on simple scalable systems. Uh, these things keep popping up that this kind of enables. So things like infrastructure as code where you just write a configuration and it can run anywhere. The ability to actually run anywhere, uh, not really caring about, you know, what is the actual environment and can it run there. 
Um, and then this whole idea of like cattle, not pets, where, you know, we don't want this like pet super server somewhere that like you've configured over years and now you don't even know what configurations were done to make it work. You really want it to be able to say like, hey, let's spin up a thousand mini instances of this thing. And if 50 of them are broken, whatever, kill it and run a new one. These are like hallmarks of, you know, reliable software. And if you don't have containerization in place here, I think you run into quite a lot of issues uh, with this stuff. And so for people that like maybe aren't from a software background or anything like this, it's basically the same reasons that, you know, shipping industries use those like one size fits all containers that, you know, you basically fill it up with stuff that you want shipped um, in your yard and then you put it on a truck and then the truck can go to a port and it can be put on different ships. And then those containers can be put off and be put on trucks again. And then those can be sent to factories or wherever they want to be. They can put in storage. Um, it enables you to just do things once. And now there's a contract that this thing will work for getting it to where it needs to go and where it needs to run. And that's that's why I like containers and why I think it's worth, um, you know, the fuss. Okay, so how are we actually using it here? So basically the Docker Compose is going to provide us ability to configure our containers. And then Docker itself is going to give us the ability to actually package up these containers and, and run them. Um, and the way I think about this is like, why are we using Docker Compose? Well, it just allows us to make more of our infrastructure code. So I kind of think of like these packages as like maybe like Ikea furniture, like everything's in there. Yes, that's a table, but like I can't necessarily use it yet. There's like a little bit of installation I need. And so you could do that yourself. And that's what a lot of people do with CLI arguments being like, hey, I want it over here and I need it to be named this thing and I need it to do this. But a better way I think is to like use Docker Compose, which is basically like your robot butler. You give it the instructions and it just like knows how to build this thing. And so now um, it's able to set it up on your computer uh, every time. And so this is really useful at scale, but it also just helps you remove things that would be manual for you and put it in code. That's why I use Docker Compose. Um, and this is exactly what those things are going to be doing. So our Docker container is basically just going to be installing the C-sharp dependencies. So this is, you know, the C-sharp runtime. It's going to be doing uh, Selenium. Selenium itself is going to be going and getting Chrome or whatever browser you want to use. It's going to build that C-sharp project. And then it's going to set up the, the dependencies as is needed. And it's going to run the project. The Docker Compose, um, the only thing we're using it really to configure is, again, to share that file system between the container um, and the computer so that we can look at those screenshots. But this is also really nice if you have like a lot of different containers because it can handle uh, the configuration of all of those. Um, and then it's going to run the container, of course, so that we actually uh, get that Docker build running. Okay, so now let's dive into the Docker code to kind of show you how it works. Okay, so I'm back in my VS Code project and we're just looking in the Docker Compose to start. This is a really simple one. Um, it's basically just the boilerplate uh, filled out. Um, so here we're just giving uh, the service a name. Uh, we're giving the container a name. This is like the dash T in your, your CLI for a Docker. We're just saying, hey, what directory it should look in? Um, where's the Docker file that it, it should be running? Um, and then the important part for us here is this volume section. And this is how we're going to have that shared volume, um, that shared file system for it to share the screenshots. We're saying, hey, in my uh, computer directory, um, we want the screenshots out folder to be connected. And so this is here where I showed you the screenshot earlier. And then we're saying, hey, we want you to connect it to here in the container. And this is just, I know that this is the directory that our app is running in. And this is where I've configured it to output. So that's why I'm connecting that to uh, the folder on my computer here. So that's the Docker Compose. And now let's look at the Docker file. And so the first section we're going to be doing is building our project. Um, and so for this, we want the .NET SDK um, image. And this is going to give us the tools to actually build our .NET projects. So first, we're going to copy in the CS proj. Uh, we're going to do .NET restore to make sure we can get those dependencies. Um, and then basically, what we're going to do is run this .NET publish. We're going to run it as release mode. Um, and then we are going to run it as self-contained uh, or build it and publish it as self-contained. Um, and this is useful because, you know, if you don't do self-contained, then you will sometimes need to package a bunch of um, like DLLs around. And it's basically just not self-contained. So it's a little bit more fast to like make sure you have everything it needs uh, to actually run successfully. Um, but self-contained is going to allow us to really easily pass this one thing um, around. And this is very useful, uh, especially in containers, because a lot of the file systems and the layers are going to be isolated. And so the less we need to keep track of from one layer to the, the next, the easier it's going to be to create these these containers. And so this is really useful for us here when we actually go to run the project where we're actually creating a new layer just for Selenium. And we're using the official standalone Chrome thing here. Um, and this is basically enabling us to say, hey, Selenium, give us the thing that you know works, that you've tested, that's you know full, all the path variables are set up, uh, everything's downloaded in the right place. And we're going to do nothing to potentially break it. All we're doing is going to copy in our C sharp code that we wrote, and we're just going to run it. And this makes these layers super, super simple because all we got to do is get our self-contained executable and run it in this layer. Okay, so now that we kind of understand how the foundations and the infrastructure of our app is set up, um, now we can go into the actual application layer of like where we're actually running the web scraping. 
And so the way that this works um, is basically like we're a puppeteer. So, you know, we have the instructions here in our project in csharp.net. It's going to be using Selenium as like our tools to actually drive this puppet. So, you know, whatever these like little string sticks are. Um, and then this internally is going to be spinning up a web driver, which is going to be able to drive this browser. And the browser is what's actually going to be the puppet. And so this is how we are basically automating this ability to pretend like we're a real browser. And this enables you to do really good end-to-end -end testing to see what would like an end user actually see on one of these modern browsers. And so again, um, the web driver we're using here is Selenium. Uh, I chose Chrome. Um, and so we need the web driver for Chrome driver in order to actually drive this, this browser. But if you're using Firefox or Safari, um, Selenium has those as well, but you just need to make sure that uh, you get the right container that, that has the right browser in it, and then also get the corresponding driver for it. Because we're using C Sharp and .NET, we also need to make sure that we are importing um, the libraries that we're going to use to actually interface here uh, with Selenium. Um, and so we need Selenium web driver. This gives us like the basic interfaces and stuff that is kind of shared across all of these web drivers. Um, but then you also need the specific one for the browser that you have. So again, I'm using Chrome and that uses the Chrome driver. So I need the Chrome driver library to make sure I have all the types and tools and stuff that, that I need. Okay. And just a quick reminder of what this code is doing. It's going to the New York Times website. It's taking a screenshot and then it's parsing and printing all the article titles. So that, that's what it's doing. And I'm about to show you the code that, that actually does that. All right. So here I am back in my project and I'm going to go to program.cs here and scroll up. And this is what it does. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to import all the libraries that we need. So system, just usually a good idea to have that. Um, and then we're pulling in Selenium, Chrome and support. Uh, first thing we're going to do is just print out to make sure that we know that this is running. And then the second one is that we're actually going to create the driver. Um, so first thing I'm doing is creating this options object. I really don't know why these are the options that work best, but through trial and error, I found them and, you know, searching around Stack Overflow, I found these ones to work best. So this is what I'm sticking with. And um, we take those options and we just create a new Chrome driver. Now this is going to take some time um, because what this is doing is it's spinning up a Chrome driver, but it's also going to be spinning up an internal instance of that browser. And then it's going to wait some time to try and make sure that the driver and the browser are talking to each other. The next thing, once that driver is created, um, is we're going to go and send it to the website. So we're sending it to New York Times right here. Um, and then to make sure that it's actually there, I'm sanity checking by just uh, printing out what is the title of the website it's at. We expect it to be New York Times. And if I look at the output that we, we had earlier, uh, theoretically, we should have that. So yeah, created the driver and then it says here, title here, the New York. Okay, the next thing we're doing is we're dealing with this compliance overlay. And this is annoying, but a lot of websites have like pop-ups, whether it's like cookies or like sign up for my newsletter or something like that. Um, and when you're using a browser or you're, you're doing this automation, you often need to deal with that. So uh, I wanted to leave it in. So first thing we're doing is we're saying, hey, does this thing exist? And we're saying, hey, driver, go find elements by ID compliance overlay. I know this is the right ID just from eyeballing it um, and looking at the inspector. And this is this is what ID they were using. Then I'm just making this helper uh, variable saying, hey, did we find any elements here? If not, then the, the overlay isn't present. If so, then we need to deal with it. And so if it is there, what we're doing is I'm taking that element that we found, um, just the first element. And you know, HTML pages are like nested. So it's just big blocks of nested things. And so what you can say is like, hey, take this element and go find inside of that element because we know, um, you know, if it's a reasonably well-structured HTML document, um, anything that's inside of that should be uh, nested under it. And so inside of that, we're going to find the element uh, that has a button on it. There's only one button on the element that I've seen. So we just find the button and we go click it. So theoretically, this gets rid of the pop-up and gives us access to the actual website um, underneath it. And so the first thing we're going to do is just take a screenshot. We do this with driver.get screenshot, and then we just need to save it off. And so if you remember in the Docker Compose, how I, I uh, connected our screenshots folder here um, with the directory inside the container, this is that container directory here. And this is how I know that it's equivalent. Um, we're just creating a GUID for its name and saving it off as a PNG. And that's what ends up here in the folder. Last thing we're going to do is we're going to go and get all of our article titles. So we're just saying, hey, driver, find all elements that are H3s. Um, just from looking at the website, again, seems like they use H3s for titles. Uh, we're going to take all those elements and get the text off of it. And then we're going to filter out anything where text is um, zero because it's just empty text. We don't need to print that out. Turn it into a list to materialize it once. And then we're just going to iterate over that and print it out. And if we look at the output of uh, the project, we see that, you know, we get all these um, titles and looks like, you know, there's a few other things that aren't quite titles, maybe like category names or something like that. But for the most part, it seems like it worked. Okay. Uh, talking about the compliance overlay, this is what it looks like. If you just navigate there, currently they want people to click this button. Um, and so if you don't get rid of this thing, uh, then you can't actually access the underlying website. And so this is more complexity, but I do think it's really important to kind of show this because this happens all the time with websites. And so you'll probably have to deal with something like this in your own web scraping journey. All right. Um, so that
that was a lot of code. I went through it very fast. So if you want to get the full source code, you can here at my website. And I also have the full project files if you want to just download those and, and run the containers yourself. Uh, finally, if you're interested in this, you might be interested in building full stack apps with F Sharp. So you can see how I do it here um, in this video. And that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.